we finally get to the whole point of calculus, really. So we leave it to the last topic, but that, that's mechanics. Before. Newton's laws of motion. We saw our starting point. And uh, you probably have seen them before. There we go. I'm sure you're very familiar. Of course. <laughs> New, Newton wrote it in Latin, you see. Yeah, cor corpus omni preservari in statu suo quisendi bel movendi uniformita. Nisi quatinus a veribus impressus cogitur status illum matur. How do I go, guys? Is that all right? Yeah? Uh, for the, uh, <clears throat> for the um, plebs amongst us, uh, uh, I'll, I'll put the translation down. There we go. <laughs> First law of motion. Basically, here it is. Everybody continues in a state of rest or uniform motion in a right line, which just means a straight line, unless it's compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. That basically means, hey, if I'm standing here stationary, I'm going to stay stationary until I get pushed or some force is put on me so I move. But similarly, if I'm travelling at a constant velocity, I will stay travelling at a constant velocity unless there is some force applied to, to the object. That's basically what the first law of motion says. The second one is probably the most famous of them all. Newtonian motus proportionalium. <laughs> the change of motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and is made in the direction of the right line in which that force is impressed. Are you impressed? Good. Basically saying this, force is proportional to the change in motion or change in velocity. Change in velocity is, of course, acceleration. So force is proportional to acceleration. That means it's equal to some constant times acceleration. And that's where we get the very famous formula. Force equals mass times acceleration. And then the third one, the most, well, misquoted one of them all, I suppose. Actually, only contrarium. <laughs> you can imagine people getting that one wrong. To every action, there is a, always opposed an equal reaction, or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed in contrary parts. I think most people say it, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's more to it than just that, though. Right? Because here I am, standing on the floor. Now, we know the force due to gravity is acting on me. So why am I not collapsing? The because the floor also has a force applying to me going up, a reaction force, which balances it out. Hence, my knees don't buckle and I don't collapse to the ground. Whilst it might have been entertaining, wouldn't be very good for me. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about forces. So forces are vectors. That's the first thing there to too. Okay? It will have a, they will have a direction, they will have a magnitude. Any force, this is why we're going to deal with it with vectors. So any force that's not vertical or horizontal, we will resolve into vertical and horizontal components. We've already been doing this. Projectile motion. We didn't call it a force in 3NIT, but it really started from the force. We started, if you remember, from just saying uh, the acceleration was G. The actual starting point is that the force was the force due to gravity. So force mass times acceleration was equal to mass times G, cancel out the masses, and we got acceleration as gravity. That's basically what we're going to be doing for all of these. But we're going to start at the forces rather than the acceleration. So resultant vectors then. We know that the resultant vector is the sum of all the different component vectors. We've seen that in our vectors. So here's something there. We've got uh, the magnitude and direction of the resultant force. So this object there has got two forces applied on it. One at 60 degrees of 3 newtons, one at 15 degrees of 5 newtons. And we say, well, these forces working together overall, what would it be? As we basically add the vectors, add the forces, let's see what it would be. So I could have done it by saying, well, I've got 3 newtons going at 60 degrees, 5 newtons at 15 degrees, so that red line would be the resultant force. That would be it. Of course, there it is, 
I can now say that's 135 degrees, and so therefore we can use, yeah, cosine rule for that one, wouldn't it? And that's the angle I'm going to find because the actual resultant angle that I'm looking for will be 60 minus that one. Sine rule, sine theta is equal to 5 sine 135 over the resultant force. So I found the angle first. That's why I use the sine rule. Now that I've got that angle, I can go, all right, cosine rule. The size of that force is 3 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times 3 times 5 cos 135. So there's the magnitude and the direction. All right, so that is one way of doing it. But we could resolve it into horizontal and vertical components. So the 3 Newton one and the 5 Newton force. And just look at each individually. There's Bob. Vertically, we've got 3 sine 60 because it's opposite the angle. So I know the component is going to be sine. So 3 sine 60. And uh, our other one will be 5 sine 15. Horizontally, we'll have 3 cos 60 and 5 cos 15. So putting it into I and J, so the components, which is what you were asking about, that would be it. Uh, sine 60, I can work out exactly. Sine 15, well, I suppose we could, but I just went straight to the calculator on that one and got uh, an approximation, 6.3296i and 3.8922j. So it'll be equivalent to with a horizontal component and a vertical component. Now, magnitude we still have to find, of course. So now we find the magnitude of that vector. And once again, we come up with 7.43. The angle, 32.59. So either way, I could have done it that way and then found the angles. The first way was playing around with geometry, I guess. Types of forces then. Resistive forces are the ones we're probably going to be most interested in. Uh, so whenever a body moves in a medium, air, water, whatever, there will always be a resistive force which will act in the opposite direction. Newton's third law is part of that. The resistance, here's the interesting bit, will always be proportional to a power of the velocity. Because when you're moving through, you don't notice as much through air. Uh, but maybe in water, if you're walking through a pool of water, like you're in the pool in the shallow end, I guess, and you're, you're walking up and down, the faster you go, you'll notice more resistance. The water's giving you more resistance. So it's usually going to be V or velocity squared. So we'll see, we'll see this a lot, where the resistive force will be some constant times V or some constant times V squared. Uh, gravitational forces, also known as weight, and that was the one we were using in projectile motion, whether or not we actually realised it or not. That's good old mg. Forces occur in pairs. That's Newton's third law. Okay. So if an object A exerts a force on object B, then object B will also exert a force on object A, same magnitude, different directions. We have what's called contact forces. The reason they're called normal contact forces is because they're at right angles to the surface and normals are at right angles. So when an object's in contact with the surface, there'll always be a force at right angles. Frictional forces. So an object will go sliding, but when it goes sliding on the surface, some frictional force comes into play. Um, it has a, a limiting value there because a magnitude, the magnitude of the force can't ex can't exceed the certain amount of friction because at some point it'll just stop moving uh, and acts in a direction opposite to the direction of motion. So again, it's in the opposite. It's a resistive force. And so you usually find that uh, the frictional force will be some constant times the normal force. And that constant, often mu we use, uh, coefficient of friction. Tension forces they happen when you use pulleys and anything basically like a string or a chain or, or something like that. It'll always go in the direction of the string and away from the object. Okay. So it's an inward force at each end. The magnitude of the force, we call it the tension. Call it the tension. When we're doing these problems, I always set positive to be the direction in which we're moving. So no longer am I going to fix myself to being going to the right as positive, going to the left as negative. I'll just say, well, which direction are we moving in? I'm going to make that the positive direction. 
always use a diagram. And now I know how you love drawing diagrams anyway. But always use a diagram so you can get a feel for which direction the forces are going in and things like that. Let's have a go at this. A box of 32 kilos has a handle on one side. Two people are trying to move it across the floor. One pulls horizontally and the other pushes from behind with a force of 25 newtons, but the box does not move. Draw a diagram of all the forces acting on the box. So I'm just using a, a point there to represent the box, all the forces. So they told me we have a force of 20 newtons. So that was the pulling one, they're pulling it. The pushing one was 25 newtons, also in the same direction though. There would be a frictional force. That would be the resistive force in this case. Now, technically there's two other forces here. There is gonna be a force due to gravity, and then there'll be the normal contact force to that. You might not end up using all the different forces, but technically they're there. In this case, we know there's a frictional force, because the first question is, find the frictional force. Yeah. So I'm gonna look at horizontal. My resultant force is what I'm interested in. And I'm gonna set it in the direction that I'm moving. Now in this case, I'm not moving because it said it doesn't move. So I've got a choice whether I, I set it going to the left or I set it going to the right. Doesn't matter in this case. I'm gonna go to the direction we're trying to push this stupid thing, even though it's not moving. So that's my resultant force. Now the resultant force is not a force. So when they say draw a force diagram, you don't put the resultant force on the diagram because the resultant force is the result of all the forces. Mx double dot, mass times acceleration, force is mass times acceleration. It will equal the sum of all the horizontal forces in this case. If it's in the same direction to which I'm moving, it'll be positive. If it's in the opposite direction, it'll be negative. I've set positive to be going that way. So therefore, force one and force two will be positive, force three will be negative. It's force three that we're trying to find. However, I know the resultant force is zero. It's not moving. So therefore the result is zero. Subbing in the ones we know then, force one was 20, force two is 25, force three is the one we're trying to find, the frictional force, so it must be 45 newtons. So there's our frictional force. Newtons, as you may well be aware, the units for force, of course the alternative that you could write instead of newtons is kilograms meters per second squared because it's mass times acceleration. The track on the left, mass of 20 kilos. Track on the right, 50 kilos. The track on the right is pulled along with a force of 120 newtons, neglecting friction in this case. So there is no friction as far as we're concerned. Calculate the tension in the chain. Let's have a look. There's two different things happening here. I've got two trucks. I'm just going to look at the left truck. So from the, the left truck's point of view, what forces do we have? Well, it's got tension. That's pretty much it, horizontally. So I know mass times acceleration for the truck on the left will equal whatever the tension is. Now, the mass of the left truck is 30. So I know 30A is equal to the tension. So acceleration must be whatever this tension is divided by 30. Now let's look at forces on the right truck. We have tension, but the tension for the right truck is going to the left. But we also have this force of 120 newtons going to the right. The resultant force, I've changed the pronumeral for this one because it's a different system. I know why we usually think of as vertical. It's just a pronumeral I'm using, okay? So my double dot, 120 is in the same direction that I'm moving. Tension in this case is in the opposite direction. So 120 minus T. So 50A is 120 minus T. We want to find tension. So five tensions over three. We know the acceleration is T over 30. It's the same piece of rope or chain or whatever it was that was joining them. So it's, the, it's not going to change just because it's a different truck. It has to be. Well, if it wasn't, one would run into the back of the other or something like that, wouldn't it? Because if it wasn't, there'd be no tension. Yeah. And you wouldn't be able to do the question. Yeah, well, that's a good point too. Uh, we make T the subject. We have 45. Mass of two kilograms this time. We're on a smooth plane inclined at 30 degrees. Um, it's connected to a mass of four kilograms. 
by a light elastic string which passes over a pulley. Draw a diagram. Okay, there's a diagram of the actual one. That's not a force diagram, of course. But there's the situation we're talking about. Force diagram. Well, what's the forces we've got happening here? The one on the plane is sitting on the plane. So there must be a normal contact force going at right angles to the plane. So I know there's a force there. Uh, it would also have a force due to gravity. Mass times acceleration. We know the mass is 2. So we get 2g. And now over on the right-hand mass, it would have a force due to acceleration as well. This one would be 4G. There would be tension going up the string, but it'll be the same tension in both because it's the same piece of string. Find the tension in the string. Oh, no, it's moving down. Find the tension in the string if the 4 kilogram block is moving down. Vertical forces, let's look at each object. On the 4 kilogram mass, it has 4G going down. It has tension going up. So the resultant force, I've called it R4 for the resultant on the 4 kilogram block. The resultant force is 4G minus T. Mass times acceleration then. So 4A is 4G minus T. The 2 kilogram mass. Now, we have 2G going straight down, but tension's at an angle, and so is the normal contact force. So I'm going to need to resolve those. But rather than resolving those two, it's simpler to resolve the gravity. So I imagine going up the plane is horizontal and the contact force is vertical. If you like, think of rotating the problem. But that means I need components of my gravitational force. 30 degrees would end up being in that spot there. Okay. So now it's not vertical and horizontal, but I'm going to say forces up the plane. So I have tension going up the plane, but I now have a component of the gravitational force going down the plane. Uh, it would be 2G sine 30. So that gives me that the, re the resultant force is equal to tension minus 2G sine 30. Mass times acceleration. Let's sub that acceleration into the first one we got for acceleration. 4g minus t will equal 2t minus 4g sine theta 30. Sine theta. Sine 30. We should be able to work out the tension now because it's the only unknown in that whole expression. So rearranging that, there it is. 4g, 1 plus sine 30 divided by 3. 19.6 newtons it turns out to be.